Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this new X-ray Panton webinar. Presenter of today is Martin Cusack, Solutions Architect for Panton Digital Business Unit. He was introduced to color science in the printing industry and has been training, teaching, and supporting others in color management for over 14 years. During the presentation of Martin, if you have any questions or doubt, you can already type them in the proper chat panel on the right hand side. At the end of the presentation, we're gonna give answer or write you back by email. The session is recorded and available starting from tomorrow on Vimeo and YouTube x right Panton channels. You're gonna all receive an email with the dedicated link. Thanks for attending and now let's Martin start the presentation. Thanks, Katia. Uh, as Clitia said, that uh, everything is going to be recorded, and then what I'm going to try to do is, as we go through the slides, I won't necessarily see any chats or questions coming through, but um, inevitably I'll try and cover as much as I can in the slides, and maybe some of your questions are going to be covered on the next slide or two. So, uh, without further ado, so the idea is the case of today is to actually go through of how Panto Live can actually help you throughout your uh, supply chain, throughout the different converters. So the main question is, is the case of why is uh, color consistency such a problem? Well, I think a lot of that is actually coming down from our own doing in terms of uh, Pantone. So x ray Pantone, Graytag being the one company. Uh, I think historically is that the fact is that Pantone are the de facto standard in the actual printing industry in a lot of industries now. And the, the color guide for what it's worth is actually starting to become or almost its own enemy, that people are actually starting to still quote the Panto name. They're actually, but they're crossing over now between the different substrates, they're crossing over to different processes, but of course the libraries of the books uh, don't necessarily change. They are printed just like anything else on a, on a standard, using, uh, using ink, using substrates, using the plates, and they are stored in different conditions. Some people have it in the bag, some people put it on the windowsill. In theory, you're supposed to actually have these books changed every 12 months. But inevitably, a lot of the time people, maybe the MD will get his new book and he'll hand down to his old book, 12 months old, two years old book, to maybe the guy in the press. So even though the actual book with a name has actually been the same, of course the book is changing. And when we changed over to the Pantone Plus, it wasn't just by adding the plus, by adding extra colors. We actually changed the formulas as well of some of these colors. So in this transition, a lot of things have actually happened. So uh, like I said, a lot of it is actually our own doing in, the, in this process. So with that said, it's a case of all these colors actually achievable. So given the different processes, given the different uh, substrates. And so the color name will actually stay the same, but it will actually, of course, when we move from one substrate to another, if we're going from paper to film, the whole dynamics of that will change. And but people's, people, if you like, perception of this won't necessarily, won't necessarily change either. They will actually still perceive to say, well, they're going to Pantone 123, they're going to Pantone 485. Um, but of course, their actual, what's achievable on that, that particular substrate or that particular process will be very, very different. So that brings us on to the, what we class as the error stack. So, the error stack actually comes in different forms. It's a case of, well, how are we communicating this standard effectively? What is the actual operator using in, in terms of the standard? How good is that standard? Is it in a decent condition? What is it in? What type of standard is it in? Uh, so was it out of his drawer? Was it something that he's just pulled out of from last time? So the error stack could be, if he's actually printing it, from Jan monthly, so if he's printing January, February, March, and he's just going to the last month, well, that 
original one could have been a down three of two away. So now he's potentially, the best he's ever going to get is two. But the numbers won't necessarily change. It just depends on where that has actually come from. So if he turns around and says, no, I have a physical standard. Well, how good is that physical standard? And what is he actually measuring it with? All of these actually accumulate up to what we class as these error stats. And as the last point really trying to uh, glean there is a case of like, you know, who is the person that's actually viewing this? And there's been lots of cases and studies taken in between the different, the color vision between males and females. And without viewing the amount of people on the, on the call, it's difficult for me to actually start to uh, go into any sorts of details, but or be politically correct, shall we say. But it's even down to the fact that women will actually see color better than men. And as much as that sticks in my throat, it is a fact. It is down to the actual factual reasons of how the actual the eye is made up. Um, it's in our DNA, et cetera. And it's even down to even the, when we're viewing a color, what are we wearing on that day? So in terms of if you are actually having a bright red jumper, then that will of course affect of how it's the color is reflected back off you. Where are you viewing that stamp sample? You know, are you actually looking in daylight? Are you looking under fluorescent tubing? All of these things will actually have an impact on the actual color and your perception of that color. So one slide here that's trying to illustrate is this, trying to illustrate the fact of how the surrounding color can actually have a big bearing. So, okay, so depending on people's screens, this will actually have an effect, but you may or may not be surprised, and some of you may have actually seen this slide already before, if you've attended some of our training sessions, but it may surprise you that, or it may not surprise you, that this green is actually the same color. But the reason why it didn't look the same color was just because of the surrounding color around it. Now, if we do not have, the whole point of all this slide is a case of if we don't have consistent measuring instruments or consistent way of actually communicating color, then we can simply just by viewing a color or viewing a sample, we can easily make decisions that aren't correct. And if we measured this green, the likelihood is that we would get obviously get the same number depending on the instrument, depending on the conditions. But we, if we didn't measure it, we could have gone off on a tangent. And in doing that, we've also got the, the communication of color as it stands at the moment. So these are classic sort of phrases that we hear. And you'll hear the actual, well, we just need, it's a little bit flat. Can you put a bit more in it? There's, you know, it, it, it doesn't give enough oomph. And depending what oomph is translated across the world is a case of, well, can you put a bit more control in this? Can you do this? It needs a bit more white, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you've also got the, depending what time of day it is. So if a customer is standing beside you and it's, you know, he's coming at nine o'clock in the morning, he feels obliged to actually say something because he's made a bit of a hundred mile round trip. He feels that he needs to actually make an adjustment. So he's telling the operator to put a bit of red in it, as it says there. So the operator kindly does that. And by the end of the day, because this guy or lady has got to get off and you know, they're going to miss their train, it's now three o'clock. Suddenly it looks great. So you may have actually, the operator may have actually come all the way back to the beginning of where he initially started from, but he's just wasted all day in doing so. So these are just some classic phrases that actually come about that we're all used to and we're all familiar with and we all let's say tolerate but at the same time when we start to talk about trying to put a standardization in in place there is almost kickback as to say well do we actually need it and yet we are obliging with some a lot of these points by actually letting them carry on so we've also got different variables. So we've just highlighted the fact that we can actually have variable in people and how between men and women, how they see color, how the variable can actually be from, um, if you imagine one substrate to the other, we can have various variables going on there, but also we can actually have variables depending on the actual conditions, depending on the substrate, 
And is, is it even possible to standardize on the substrate? Well, the substrates of today are actually, uh, where possible, they're trying to be standardized, but they're actually varying to a degree. And speaking from the manufacturer's point of view, we've also got the difference from device to device. So what we've tried to do as of the last few years is try to standardize certain of these types of instruments to, to the XRGA, so the x ray Graphic Art Standard. So what we're trying to do there is actually say that from a, a repeatable point of view, from a consistent point of view, we are going to have some standard approach. So when x ray and Greater came together, as much as they may actually have a spectrophotometer each, they would all be slightly different. So the idea of this was to actually just standardize it and actually say this is what we want to work to. So what happens when the starting point is not the same? Well, you're going to get a different reading. That's it. It's just a fact of that. So again, what we're, from all that point, what we're trying to do is actually put some things in place to make sure that you have some standardization put in place. And one of the biggest factors that is not often considered or thought through is even down to the ink formulation. So we're aiming towards a particular ink, but the ink formulation element is just skipped. But it's absolutely essential that this isn't. And to try and standard, standardize it across, let's say site one to site two, we're aiming towards the same formulation of the color. And all of these actually go into the fact of what the Aristac is. And just to give you a visual interpretation of that, the customer may actually have this particular color in place. And because if we aren't going to the same standard digital color, and we'll go into maybe what the idea of the conception of that color is, or maybe the, phys the physical, physical pantone book that that designer has, you can visually see here how that color may get misinterpreted, may get changed, may get amended just because of their interpretation of this error stack. Now you can also see there that the, the maybe between the customer and the printer color isn't that far away. That's because the problem doesn't necessarily go away until it hits the printer. So the converters, you guys are on the call, are usually the guys that have to actually, if the book stops with you. So it's usually you that has to put this right. And as I described earlier, Maybe the customers come on site. Maybe the customers turn around now and actually start to actually say, well, it doesn't match this, what I had in mind. And they may have pulled out a proof. They may have pulled out something out of their back pocket, say, I want you to match this. Or like the phrases earlier were saying, it's too flat. It's too red. I want you to do something about it. So from a visual interpretation, this is exactly what's happening in today's world. So what can we do to actually control this? Well, what we can actually go and do is actually start to put some digitization in place and we can actually start to, and what we have tried to do over the years is actually work to the spectral data. So a lot of our instruments and a lot of our, uh, what we've, our ethos has been tried to be, uh, tried to be done is actually work to this CXF color. So a lot of our applications will allow us to actually load in and communicate and share the CXF color. So it takes away a lot of the ambiguity. It, it, takes, it comes with all the spectral data is actually included in this color. Everything related in there, it's covering all the light sources, so we're okay with that. So however this color gets, let's say, portrayed, viewed, or analyzed, there's enough information in there that allows the customer the flexibility of doing that. So it's the true DNA of the color, if you like. And again, a lot of this is potential marketing speak, but it is the actual true DNA of the color. So once, once the color has actually been measured by, if you imagine exact, now the exact may have actually had the, the device has been net profiled. So for the people not familiar with uh, net profile, it's making sure that one instrument to the next instrument are actually consistent. So when we go and measure this color and communicate and share this color around, everybody's therefore going to the same standard. 
And a lot of the time, people will turn around and say, yeah, but I've been going to LAB in the past. What's wrong with LAB? Well, LAB is, it doesn't contain all the spectral information. It's locked, if you imagine, to one light source, one condition. So like the light indicators on screen are trying to show you there is that if we move from D50 to another light source, for, for example, fluorescent, that information is not transferred. So when, when your customer, when you produce something on site and your customer is viewing it in their boardroom or somewhere else in store maybe, it's going to have a different characteristics. So it's important that what we do is we communicate via the spectral data. So therefore this will allow us to actually cover metamerism. So it will allow us to actually cover for the different light changes of how this will affect and won't affect in different conditions. And again, the actual hardware and the software that we, we uh, distribute will allow us to actually encompass that. So when the operator is actually making his measurements, he can also view if it's specified by the converter or by the customer. He can also look at different lighting conditions live as, he, as he's producing. He doesn't have to keep his fingers crossed when he's produced it and then worry about it later. So there are advantage, another main advantage of just using the spectral data over LAB. The next thing of course is to try and help this is just the, the communication all around. So if we actually pull the standards from a single source and that's what the Panto Live part is about is that what we're trying to do is actually just centralize our color data so we actually have the ideal digital references that are achievable. Now we'll come on to that in a minute, that there is achievable conditions, achievable processes that allow us to actually effectively centralize this color data and then different people in the supply chain, different people from site to site can actually from, let's say country to country, can access this Pantone Live database and actually start to actually then go to achievable results. So it's not just about um, standardizing your instrument, we're also trying to standardize on the, the color and the, 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 your processes that are going through. In relation to these standards, we have what we call master and dependent standards. So the master standard in effect would be your Pantone book, so if you think of it like that, and the dependent, as the name would actually say, is the case of a way as Panto and X-Rite have actually gone and produced these dependent libraries, dependent on the process, dependent on the substrate. And we are in the cloud giving people the access to both the master and the dependent libraries. So if you are producing on film, and it's Flexo, you, and then you're doing Pantone 485, for example, you would actually go to the dependent library over and above the master one. So therefore, as the screen is showing you on the right-hand side, is that the cluster around that you're aiming towards, or the, the circle that you're aiming towards, is more realistic and achievable than if you were to go to the master. So the tolerances that customers are now banding around on average would be a delta of three. Uh, and, and we can argue all day whether three is negligible, et cetera, et cetera, or, or well, my customers are only saying two, and what about the delta equation? All of these are, are good points. But what we're trying to do here is actually at least give people achievable and predictable results. So therefore, they can actually be a bit more efficient as they do not have to get beaten up by their customers to say, well, it doesn't match. Nobody, and I say this honestly, realistically, a lot of the converters and a lot of the printers don't go into work to do a bad job. They are trying to actually go in there to do a decent job, to actually be a bit more efficient, and so they get their boss off their back. So the idea is, is a case of that within all these standards, there is the actual entire spectral data is considered. Within the dependent libraries, we also have the tint information. So all of the information is available depending on what area you actually want to look at. So if a company is actually looking at 
a 50% tint on a Flexo dependent library, the information is there. So he can actually, he or she can actually go in and take a look at that. But these dependent libraries are a representation of the master. So it's not, it's not just a case that we've just gone and printed whatever. They are, of course, a close match, as close as physically possible to the actual representation. So they are a representation of the master. But they are, of course, taken into, into account the substrate they're printed on and the printing process itself. So that said, that what we're now actually doing is actually gluing all this together in terms of the different people in the actual process that's being able to effectively connect to that. So if you are a designer, there is the facility via Illustrator. And at the moment, it is only Illustrator. Maybe this will change and develop as this is an evolving system, by the way. So it's not just hard and fast fixed now. So as it, as it stands at the moment, we have an Illustrator plugin that the designers can actually go in. So we're not actually giving them an extra software which may be related to a printer, maybe, that is just totally alien to them. This is an application that they use daily. And what it is is a plugin for Illustrator that what it allows you to do is ineffectively uh, view this spectral information that we've, we've, we've been referring to all morning. And because Adobe, in its, let's say, uh, area, it will only allow us to actually look at just the RGB data. It will not allow you to actually look at the entire spectral data. So if you think about it, then if somebody's looking at it on screen, and we can talk about whether it's a calibrated screen, which is ideal, of course, but let's actually say it's, it, it is calibrated, and if they look at it on screen, they're not looking at the true color of what that design will actually be on that given substrate. If they go via the plugin and look at the viewer section of the plugin, they'll start to see exactly how it will look. Now, if, the color, if they're not sure of what the color is going to be or what substrate is going to be on rather, they can at least be putting it on as what they consider to be the appropriate master and somebody else in the, in, later down in the food chain, i.e. the pre-media, maybe he can swap it out. But this will literally just be a click of a button. It won't be a major surgery that he has to go through. And that said, the guys in the pre-media, again, using different applications, so with the ESCO or the GMG suites, they can again go through, so when they're printing it, it will be, if it's a Pantone Live friendly application, it will allow that software to go in browse the actual cloud, swap out the appropriate color for the appropriate substrate, uh, i.e. dependent library if needed. So moving around the screen, again, the ink manufacturer, now you'll, you'll, you'll potentially see the Sun logo tattooed on some of our information, and that's because they're our preferred partner. But that, that said, it doesn't mean to say that any other ink supplier can't get on board with this. So what we are giving, in effect, is the, the target to aim to, the standard to aim to. We're not necessarily giving out a recipe or, or the breakdown of that particular color. So if a, another ink supplier in one of your sites happened to be your preferred partner, then they could actually get on board. They could download and actually aim towards this centralized standard, and they could actually mix the color accordingly but safe in the knowledge that they go into the same standard that maybe the guy in the pre-media has gone to. It's not their version of a 485 or the pre-media's version of a 485. And then it saves, it saves this error stack occurring that I showed you earlier. Similarly then, if that actually goes onto the press, whichever type of press it may be, then you also get the press guy with a particular friendly application to aim towards the same standard and it just reduces this issue that we talked about. So that actually then also takes away the hatred, potentially, between Mr. Ink Guy and Mr. Press Guy, because these two always get on, of course. They're always writing to each other at Christmas and actually saying, we love you. Uh, but of course, it's, a, it's that allows them to actually work to the same standard. And they can actually measure it off, safe in the knowledge that what they're submitting for the next two, three days work maybe is actually accurate. 
So that said is that there are different applications, as I've already touched on, that actually are Panto and Live friendly. So just as you see there from the ink manufacturer side of things, there are different people already on board that has the facility to access this and do access this. And also you'll see that the exact is XRGA native. That said, if somebody has a, a, a X-Ray Spectra Eye uh, and that they're being used in it, that too can actually also be upgraded to XRGA. So depending on how old it is, how often it's been serviced, that can either be done in the field or it can actually be done by an X-Ray office. The best thing for you to do in that instance is really just to communicate to your X-Ray uh, rep or your service uh, contracts that you actually have with X-Ray and they will deal with that. But if you send your device in for a service, they will not automatically up upgrade it to XRGA without your say. So if and when you're ready, you can do this. So in terms of software, as I've already touched on, that there is the facility to actually go via Adobe, there's the facility to go via the ESCO uh, guys and the GMG. From a printer conversion point of view, there's different people, so it's built in already to WNH. Of course, there's an X-Rite side of things and that we already have some partners in place with color metrics, phototype, etc. And then you see straddled across a lot of these is where we have the color cert. So color cert allows us to actually measure uh, direct access from the software, so it's easy for the operator. So if the operator's at two o'clock in the morning is trying to access uh, the, the, the cloud, he can do so directly from the software. He can pull the color directly in as he can within IQC. So that then allows us to actually go through straight from maybe the brand, the design of the customer, all the way through to a centralized system. So if that, once we've actually gone and done that, we can also close the loop because a lot of converters and a lot of multiple sites are talking about, well, I need to see some feedback. And what that feedback actually comes in the form of is different, different graphs, different reporting, different analysis, and different people want to see different lots of information. So for example, Mr. Production Manager would actually turn around and actually say, I would like to see how consistent we are shift to shift from site to site. And the operator also would like to, once he's gone and done his measurements, he could potentially just print out a small A4 report that illustrates that that job has passed. He's conformed to the so-called tolerances that was either specified by the site or specified by the customer. He can print that out. He can put it on top of the pallet. He can put it on top of the, the roll in effect. And that goes with the job. So all of these things that I'm referring to allow us to start to actually control and effectively be a bit more efficient in how we go about things. So we've come away from a personal effect of, I think that that color is, is correct. I think it's dark enough. I think it's light enough. We're trying to come away from that. And we're trying to give realistic, achievable targets so that you as the converter can actually achieve consistent and you can plan better for your work. So once you've done this, certainly within the color search side of things, if you've got the, the scorecard part of it, then this information can be actually reviewed remotely. You do not have to have the actual software in front of you. You could simply dial in and actually see the fact that actually these sites are actually behaving themselves and are consistent and you can share and share work from site to site. You can see how consistent you are from let's say the Siam. So even if you're trialing new ink, it's an area for you to report this information and, and actually analyze this information. And just a few slides here of some of the things that the likes of Chesapeake have gone and done where this is what they've actually found the, the, their benefit. So it's helped reduce production costs. It's actually helped save time. And overall, it's actually given them a total saving of a million sheets annually. So all of these factors built up have actually gone and given, given this organization this particular thing. 
Now, for sure, that they've had to take it from the ground up. They've had to look at their instruments. They've had, had to look at how they're measuring. They've had to try to centralize that. But the effects that we've just gone through on, this, on the slides have all gone and actually allowed them to do that. So just really a summary of, in effect of what we've gone through is that we've had to, we're defining and digitizing our color standards. So we're taking away the human element. We're taking away the fact of has it faded, etc. cetera. We're, we're achieving and we're setting realistic expectations. And we can do that. We can predict that. We are communicating as best as we can by and being a bit more efficient in how we communicate from site to site. We're putting in a standardization. We're putting in some types of SOPs that are achievable and realistic. And then to kind of close the loop, to kind of monitor how we're getting on, we're actually getting decent analytical feedback and we're not pressing the panic button if something went wrong as to who did it wrong and why did you do it that way. So those are the type of summary that we've tried to actually illustrate to you today in terms of how these uh, practices can be effectively applied. So with that said, I'll kind of hand it back, if you like, to Clitzia, and we can actually go through any particular questions maybe that people have had. Thank you so much, Martin, for this excellent presentation. So we give a couple of minutes to the attendees. And yes, the presentation is uh, available. We have recorded this uh, session, so you're going to receive tomorrow an email with a link to our Vimeo and YouTube channels. So this was the first question, because of course somebody maybe did log in uh, some minutes after that we started. So Martin, we have the first question related to the presentation. Yep. Does the cloud provide actual data for ink formulation for a specified color? No, as I said, that the actual, if you imagine that there's a color a, uh, on, on the cloud, it's uh, if, the, if the user is actually using ink formulation, they would actually download the standard, i.e. a 485, and they would actually make the color up themselves depending on the ink type that they were using. So if they're using flint ink, they would actually make their particular color up using that color, their, their ingredients, if you like. Okay, the second one, they're asking how, how the master data are measured. Uh, again, it's, that's through the actual process that uh, x -Rite and Pantone have gone through. So when we've actually, we've gone through the rigorous testing of this and we, we have made it so uh, in conjunction with some of our partners. Okay, so going on, they're asking, are the color values given by spectral measurement or the... the everything is on, online that is, so when you actually, when you come to download the color, it will be a spectral, the a spectral data will be available to, to you. Uh, well, the color will be available to you. You won't necessarily, it's the, 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 the spectral information is protected so, uh, but everything is there for you. So if you're actually looking at under D50 or D65 or F11, the facility is available for you to actually view all the information you need, put it that way. So we have still uh, four or five uh, questions pending. So the next is uh, who creates dependent standards? Are they created automatically from master standards? Again, we've, we've gone and done that. So when we've gone through, as this library at the moment is growing, so in effect, we've, we've now got 22 libraries. So what we're trying to do is effectively grow that, if you imagine, year on year. And until we feel as though maybe I think it's 60 to 65 libraries would actually cover everything that we think is sufficient at the moment, but we've actually got 22.
Okay, and uh, will the results depend on the version of the information and the spectrophotometer used by the printer? Certain ink formulation applications such as IFS 6, as I said, has to be compliant to Pantone Live. So older versions won't have access to Pantone Live. So you, first of all, you need that. In terms of the device, again, you would need an XRGA device. Okay, great. The last one is uh, what is the recommended accuracy to go against to and what delta E formula is to be used? It's, it's dependent on the actual customer. It's dependent on your requirements. I mean, what we're trying to do is actually give you, instead of aiming towards a master, if you are going over to a, as one of the slides was trying to show you there, you may not actually achieve it under a, a, a certain delta E of, let's say, three. Um, it's up to what the customer requires. I mean, if people start to actually ask us about, well, in terms of equation, then typically I would turn around and actually say a Dow 3 2000. But it can depend on the particular customer and their, their particular requirements. Okay, Martin, we have some other uh, questions, but I would say that they are more specific, so maybe we can uh, answer by email to these people. And also in the chat, I've just typed for everyone the email address. It's printmarketing underscore eu at xray.com. So you can keep on uh, writing to us, of course, uh, today, tomorrow, and whatever you have any doubt about any topic related to color management. For further information, you can also get in touch with our European Marketing Director, Paula Rosales, at the email address that you can see now on your screen. So, prosales at xray.com. And uh, we have already on our Vimeo channel a dedicated page where we have collected all the webinars and videos uh, done so far. And you can see the URL. So, Martin, thanks a lot for your time and your presentation and uh, we wish everyone a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye.